Hello, internet. Your friendly neighborhood gremlin here. And today, we're pulling out another fairy tale. This time, we're going to cover Cinderella. I cannot entirely tell you why I chose Shari for this. Mostly, she was thin enough that she would wear the dress without distorting it. And also, uh, I didn't like the house that I made her. Because, as you can see, this is indeed a remodel. We were, however, marginally desperate. Because I needed someone to do a fairy tale. That's a lie. I didn't need to do a fairy tale at this moment, but nobody was showing up on the island who wanted to do something that I wanted to do. And so we decided on Cinderella, and I hated the house I designed Shari originally. And of course, also the evil stepsister dress was going to fit on her without distorting too much. Not entirely sure that matters. She's not going to show up in any of the pictures. Though, I mean, when we're being completely honest with ourselves, None of this build went exactly the way I imagined that it would. To be fair, this downstairs interior goes very well. I do really like it. I think I've done well, but uh, I tried to do an upstairs and that didn't happen. And then I had to refilm outside because the first time I did it, it was awful. So while I think it's obvious that there's a lot of inspiration for this original build here from Disney Cinderella, you'll notice of course that she sleeps in the kitchen here because that is how it is in the original fairy tale. She, as far as I know, doesn't have another bedroom. Maybe that is only the Charles Perrault version? I don't think so. I think it shows up in any version in which they refer to her as Cinderella, because the reason she got the name Cinderella is because of the ashes that are always on her clothes and things. I do, however, think we're gonna wait until slightly later in the build to go over the whole Cinderella fairy tale and the differences between some of the more common English versions, because um, the outside is boring and I don't have much to say about it, but I really like the inside, so I kind of want to talk about it for a little bit. So the giant decaying vine in the corner there may have been a questionable decision, but I'm imagining that even though they are wealthy because they have money and they are invited to balls and are often referred to as nobles or noble people, they also, as far as I can remember, at least again in the versions that I'm most familiar with, do not hire any other help. So they only have Cinderella to do all the cooking and cleaning and things. So the kitchen is probably not kept up very well, given that it's just the place where Cinderella exists and none of the other family has to see it. And also I just kind of liked the mystical fairy tale feel the vine had. And so it stays. And of course we add a staircase because I'm imagining it's kind of like a um, basement or even if it's just sort of slightly below ground would make the most sense because when you think of times in which electricity does not exist and we don't have a fridge or anything in here, the storage rooms and things of that nature usually were underground because it kept them cooler. Also, I just kind of like the sort of faux stairs effect. We will eventually cover that little gap in the stairs there that is super not noticeable, but also kind of noticeable when you know that it's there with a clock because I needed to put a clock there. Actually, I just needed a clock in general and by the time I remembered I wanted a clock, the rest of the room was full. Here we are getting the sort of kitchen ready and we're going to add that little dishes table thing because I don't know. I like it. It's cute. And of course, also a small table, which I'm going to try and put way too many chairs at. Don't worry, we end up with only two chairs. I mean, I'm imagining that it is only for her to eat at by herself because her father is a bad person and they probably wouldn't let her eat with them because she's covered in ashes and so she's dirty. That may be a thing that we should maybe talk about, the fact that her father is a horrible person. Because of course, speaking of the Disney edition and also I believe in more modern storybook editions, father dies or at the very least is sent off to war or sent away on business or something. In all of the tales I read for reference today, he's alive. The man's just there, letting these people walk all over his daughter, which is like pretty fucked up. I've been trying to get that spinning wheel and stool combination to work for like forever. I suppose it will be a while before we manage to do Rumpelstiltskin because I can't make it work, but now we're just picking out things to sort of fill the area up a little bit. Don't worry, I do abandon the ironing board. It was merely a concept, but again, no electricity, I kind of want it to look older, so ironing board is not really going to fly. We do, however, pull the Disney card again because I'm going to add a doghouse and eventually a little stuffed dog, mostly just because of the one in the Disney movie, who I'm pretty sure is named Bruno. That may be a lie. I don't know why I want to call him Bruno. That is just the name that comes into my brain when I think about it, but I wanted some more things to sort of clutter up the basement a little bit, you know, just to like make it look messier and things. And also because there are a few more items that I wanted that were old timey that I just kind of wanted to exist, like the milk can and the butter churn. And of course, if you think about it, the kitchen is probably not super tidy. I imagine it's not like dirty, but 
She's spending all of her time upstairs cleaning the things other people can see and will judge her for. She comes down to the kitchen and no one else is going to be here. Why is she going to make sure it's super tidy? Which is a perfectly reasonable reason and not a justification just because I like things to be extremely cluttered. Of course, now comes the clock, which I mentioned in the beginning before we add in all of our miscellaneous, or I guess smaller items is maybe a better term for that. Oh, I do suppose five minutes in is as good a time as any to start talking about the actual fairy tale. I do think that this time around it would be best to start talking about the Charles Perrault version given that it is sort of the one the Disney version is based off of, and that is, I imagine, the most well-known version of Cinderella, at least in the English-speaking world. I suppose it'd be best to start with a basic plot rundown. It's a man and his daughter. His wife has just died. It is like medieval times. He does not think he can bring up his daughter without a wife, and so he marries another woman. He, for unknown reasons, chooses a woman who has already had two children herself. Her husband having died, she needs a husband, they get married. She takes one look at Cinderella, and as is expected of stepmothers in fairy tales, takes one look at Cinderella and says, sorry little girl, but your mother is dead, and so now you will be our slave. And also don't bother telling your father, because he's like totally cool with it. Watch him not do anything for several years. And then several years pass. She is a young adult. At least I'm hoping she's at least a young adult. It is fairy tales, so what happens when she's like 13, doesn't matter. Anyway, imagining she is of legal age. And the king decides that his son needs to be married now. And so he decides to throw a ball for all of the eligible maidens in the kingdom. And I mean, given that they do not see Cinderella as a person, she is not invited to the ball with them. So they leave, she cries, her fairy godmother shows up, says, it's okay, it's cool. Just bring me a pumpkin and some lizards and some rats and we'll build you a carriage and give you a beautiful dress. Everything will be fine. Just go to the ball, have fun. Do be home by midnight though. So she goes to the ball and her face is no longer covered in ashes. So her stepsisters do not recognize her. And she is beautiful because of course she is. She's going to be a princess in a minute. The prince is immediately entranced, dances with her all night. It's lovely, they're having a great time. The clock strikes midnight. She sort of jumps up and quickly exits. In her haste, she leaves a glass slipper behind upon the stairs. No, in the original story, there's a second night of the ball, but it's entirely irrelevant, so we're gonna get out here. Anyway, the sisters come home, they tell her all about the ball and this beautiful, mysterious woman who the prince has declared that he is absolutely in love with and must find. The only trouble, of course, being that he only has this glass slipper to prove her identity. And as such, he sends out his footman to go and try the slipper on absolutely every eligible maiden in the kingdom. And so they go. And when they arrive at Cinderella's house, they ask her stepsisters to try on the slipper. It doesn't fit. So Cinderella just kind of like slides up and is like, hey, why don't we see if it might fit me? And everyone looks at her like she's a little bit nuts because, I mean, the woman's dressed in rags. Anyway, they say, well, the prince said every eligible maiden. And so they let her try on the slipper and it fits. And then to their astonishment, she pulls out the other glass slipper. It's like, yeah, see, totally me. Let's go. And now, of course, where the story shows its age, I guess it's Peraltness, given that he has to have a moral for every story. These stepsisters lay themselves at her feet and beg her to forgive them because they've been so terribly awful. And now she is going to be a princess. And of course, Cinderella doesn't have a backbone or any personality of her own. And so she says, I forgive you with all my heart and I hope you will always love me. She exits. She goes meet the prince. The prince is like, oh, you are so much more charming even than before. Let us get married. And then, of course, just to lay home the part that she's like the best, nicest person in the world, she gives her sisters a place to stay at the palace, so they will always be taken care of. This Pearl Tale actually has two morals, the first of which being graciousness is more important than beauty, without it nothing is possible, with it one can do anything, and of course, the second moral, which I'm going to read verbatim, without a doubt, is a great advantage to have intelligence, courage, good breeding, and common sense. These and similar talents come only from heaven, and it is good to have them. However, these may fail to bring you success without the blessing of a godfather or godmother, which like totally just means be nice and smart and kind, but also don't be mad at me when you're still a peasant who has an unfortunate life. Sorry. The second version of the tale that we're going to talk about is called The Cinder Maid and has been attributed to Joseph Jacobs. The largest deviation between this tale and the Pearl tale we've just spoken of is, of course, there is no fairy godmother. Instead, to get her wish, she goes to cry at the grave of her mother and the hazel tree that she planted there. And she sings this cute little rhyme. Tree o mine, o tree o me, with my tears I've watered thee. Make me a lady fair to see, and dress me as splendid as can be. At which point a nut falls from the tree. There's a bird that's like, open the nut, dear. And inside she finds shoes and a dress. Which, I mean, don't ask me how that fit in a nut. She has, of course, a beautiful dress and some shoes made of copper. And then 
just to extend our disbelief even further, while she is getting dressed, the tree opens and from within becomes a carriage with four horsemen and she is ready to go to the ball. Of course, the beyond by midnight warning still exists. She goes to the ball. She dances with the prince. She is home by midnight. This ball is going to be three days. She can, well, kind of excessive. Also, it's like the rule of threes makes way more sense than two nights. Anyway, so second night, she goes back to the tree. Please, I need a dress. When falls from the tree is a dress and some silver shoes this time. The final night of the ball comes. She goes back to the tree. She gets gold shoes. And then on her way out, the prince has decided to be a clever little boy. And he doesn't want her to run away because he wants to marry her. So he spreads a bunch of tar on the stairs and her shoes get stuck. So while she's escaping the tar, she leaves a shoe behind. So again, kingdom-wide search for the girl who fit the shoe. When he arrives at Cinderella's house, her stepsisters are there. The first stepsister tries on the shoe. It doesn't fit. She is desperate to become a princess. So she cuts off a bit of her toe and a bit of her heel. And then to his credit, now this is not going to be the same. Next story. When Prince sees her, he says, no, I, I don't think this is right. This is not the girl. But his father's like, but you said you'd marry the one with the shoe. So he says, okay, whatever, I guess. And then as they are riding away, the little bird comes out and is like, hey, look, look at the shoe. Look at all the blood coming out of the shoe. Think maybe something's wrong here? So they turn around and deliver her back. At this point, the second stepsister tries the exact same thing. It goes exactly the same way. So they take her back to her mother. And the prince says, you sure you don't have another daughter by any chance? There must be someone else here, someone who will fit the shoe. And the stepmother and her daughter say, no, of course not, absolutely not. Father is like, yeah, I do kind of have another daughter. And the stepsister are like, cinder maid? No way, absolutely not. She couldn't possibly be the woman you were looking for. The prince is like, well, I mean, she's of noble birth. She has a right to at least try on the shoe. And the henchman goes downstairs to the kitchen to see Cinderella and says, can you try this shoe on for me? So she slips the shoe on, it fits. She pulls out the other shoe from where she'd been hiding it, puts it on as well. The herald is like, yep, nope, this is, this is definitely the one. So she goes upstairs and the story is very keen to point out that as the prince saw her face, he knew that she was the one he was looking for. So they go off to the palace and get married and live happily ever after. Now the final story I wanna cover is sort of the second most well-known, I suppose. It is in fact the Grimm Brothers version of the tale. This one will probably be a little shorter. It is pretty similar to the last one. Our first deviation is when she's asking to go to the ball. Cinderella arrives at her stepmother and is like, please, please let me come to the ball with you. Her stepmother's like, no, look at you. This is actually, in fact, the story where they mention why she was called Cinderella. Her stepsisters ridiculed her and they used to spill peas and lentils into the ashes and she'd have to pick them out again. And of course also that because she did not have a bed and to sleep on the hearth of the fire, she was always covered in dirt and ashes. And that is why they called her Cinderella. So the stepmother is like, no, you can't possibly come with us. You must clean these lentils. Pick the good ones from the bad ones. And if there's a single bad one in with the good ones, when we come back, you will be in serious trouble. So they go to the ball. Cinderella sits down to start picking through the lentils when two pigeons show up. And they're like, hey, Cinderella, do you want us to maybe help you with that? She's like, wow, really? That would be great. Thank you so much. I'd really appreciate it. And pigeons are like, well, since we're going to do this and you're just going to get in our way, why don't you go up? and stand in the pigeon roost where you can see the ball. So she goes and watches all night. And then the next morning when her sisters come home, they're telling her about the ball and how beautiful it was. And she's like, oh yes, I saw how glistening and beautiful the lights were. And they're all like, I'm sorry, what? How did you see that? She's like, oh, well, you know, after I finished doing my work, I went up to the pigeon roost and I could see it from there. And they tear down the pigeon roost because, you know, don't let her have good things. So the next night, as they're getting ready to go to the ball, they're like, oh, well, we don't want you to have too much time on your hands. I mean, you spent all that time in the pigeon roost last night. What on earth are you to do with yourself tonight? Here's a giant bag of seeds. If you could pick the good ones from the bad ones, and we'll see you in the morning. Sisters leave, our pigeon friends show up, and are like, hey, Cinderella, would you like some help with that? To which she responds, of course, absolutely. Thank you so much. The pigeons are all like, hey, Cinderella, do you want to go to the ball? I mean, I would love to go to the ball, but look at me. Dressed like this, I would mortify the prince. The pigeons are like, no, totally cool. Just go to that little tree you planted on your mother's grave and shake it and wish yourself some beautiful clothes. Just do remember, be back before midnight. So Cinderella goes and she shakes the tree and she gets a dress. And then when she returns to the front door, there is a carriage. Just so you know, first dress is silver. We do this a whole again, another night, gold. Exact same as the last story. And again, like the last story, the prince spreads pitch on the stairs. She is caught unawares. I don't know what the difference between tar and pitch is. 
I think they're kind of like the same thing. Anyway, she leaves behind a shoe. They go on a hunt. This time, instead of both sisters cutting off both parts of their feet, one sister removes the toes of her feet and the other sister removes the heel. But again, we got some pigeons. They're like blood. Look at the blood. Of course, the other major difference is that the prince looks at these stepsisters and is like, okay, cool, yeah, you're the girl I'm gonna marry. Until the birds are like, yo, bro. No, that I think is his major failing, but she puts the shoe on in the end, they get married happily ever after. And starting from the second version of this story, the pigeons peck out the sister's eyes, and they must live forever blind. You know, just like super normal, regular fairy tale stuff. Anyway, this is about the end of the build. I would love to hear down below what your favorite version of Cinderella is, especially if it's one I didn't talk about here today. Um, obviously Cinderella stories exist all over the world. They're in China, they're in Russia, they're everywhere. Let me know about one. Maybe I'm not as familiar with, or just the one you grew up listening to as a child. I would love to know. Fairy tales are the thing I love to talk about absolutely most in the world. Anyway, do like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see y'all tomorrow. Goodbye!